How's everybody doing? Good? You good? This rain is wonderful if you want to take a nap, right? <laughs> this is for me. Um, well, happy Mother's Day. Um, it's true. We want to honor moms. You Moms have been such a huge part of our lives and what they do. So thank you, moms, for all that you do in our lives. But I also know that this can be an emotional day for some. So and if it is an emotional day for you, know that the Lord is with you. He loves you. He brings peace and comfort also for you on this day because he loves you dearly. So we're wrapping up our sermon series, Who Are You? This sermon series was designed to, to let us look at his word and see how um, we can know our identity. And this is important in our lives that we know who we are and why we belong to him. Because of him, that is our identity. So I have a question for you before we get started. And this identity um, that we'll look at today is, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? What do you think of? Now, I imagine a lot of us in here think of stuff like someone who believes in Jesus, someone who loves Jesus, someone who's forgiven, someone who's kind and generous and loves like he does. Yes, that's what we can think of. And a lot of us think that because... A lot of us are probably Christians in here, but what if we go outside of these walls and we go out in downtown Bashop or downtown Austin or we go um, to New York or somewhere and we start asking people, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? We're going to get a lot of different answers and a lot of different views on what that has looked like. And uh, and, and we're going to get people who are going to say, oh yeah, Christians, they're weak-minded they're out of touch with um, society or the world or culture. They're unforgiving, they're mean, they're judgmental, they're legalistic, and they always seem to be against something or someone. And it's so sad that that could be the view of what Christianity is, of who are we supposed to be in Christ. And here's the deal. There's many, many reasons to say why people will say that. There's all kinds of reasons. We're not going to get into that. But we do have to do this. I want us, I will to take ownership in the fact that it is because of us of why they think that. Because this is my problem many times that I'm not a great reflection of who Christ is in this world. And so when they don't see that great reflection and they see judgmental, people and they see those type things that's what they're going to think of when you are claiming to be a christian but acting that kind of way now through time this word christian has been manipulated in a sense um, and through history and culture of what it means to be a christian in this world now the first time the word christian was used um, in scripture that we know of is um, at the church of Antioch and Acts 11 speaks of it in verse 26 it says for a whole year they met with the church in large and taught large numbers the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch this was one of the first church plants after Pentecost when Peter spoke and the spirit came this is one of the first church plants of the Christianity of, of Jesus. So the, and in fact, in this time, the churches were first called um, churches of the way, or sects, S-E-C-T, of the way, because they were preaching and teaching of the way of Jesus. And here it says, as they were teaching, um, and, and the church was growing in large numbers, that the disciples of Jesus were first called Christians here. And they were called Christians, the word is Christianos in Greek, because they were defining what kind of disciples they were. They needed to define it. There's all kinds of disciples. Disciple is a student who, who projects what his uh, teacher has taught him. So there's all kinds of religions and other gods out there. So they're saying this disciples here at the church of Antioch, they are disciples of Jesus. So we're going to call them Christians because they are followers of Christ. And that's what that word means. Christianos, mean, Christianos means follower of Christ. They were defining further what these disciples were. Now, it's sad that 2,000-something years later, there's still the issue with this word in a sense of what it does. But there's always going to be a problem because we live in a fallen world and the gospel, the cross, the gospel is offensive. So there's always going to be people who are going to reject and be against those who follow Jesus. But 
I really hope it's not because of our actions and our attitude and our character that they turn away from someone like him because as followers of Jesus, we should project who he is. Another problem with this term is people think they are Christians when they're not. It's just the truth. People say, well, my parents are Christians, so I'm a Christian, and that's just not the truth. Or I'm a Christian because I was born in America. I'm a Christian because I was born in Texas, and I've heard that one literally, and I do not think they were joking. <laughs> I'm a Christian because I go to church. That one is very common. But coming in here, sitting, does not make you a Christian. Being a Christian is being a follower of Jesus. You identify with him and who he is. You are a disciple called to follow him each and every day of your life. So Matthew 9, 9 tells us, this is Jesus' call of, on us and specifically Matthew here. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. Jesus calls us to follow him, to believe in him, to do what he does, to go where he goes, to simply follow him. He did not go to Matthew and say, you know what, Matthew, I need you to go to synagogue more or bring it more modern. Matthew, I need you to go to Bible study more often or to church. He didn't go, Matthew, I need you to pray five times a day. And by that, you will know me more and people will know that you are a Christian he didn't say, Matthew, you know what, if, if, if you would just follow these rules, and he hands him a sheet of paper, if you wake up and follow these rules every day, you'll know me more and better. No, he just said, I want you to follow me. He calls Matthew and he says, I want you to leave where you're at and follow me. Matthew, I want you to leave where you're at in this comfortable place, in your money, in your wealth, in your security all of those things. I want you to leave where you're at and I want you to follow me. And he calls us to do the same thing. He says, I want you to leave where you're at. You're going to leave the old life behind. I want you to leave where you're at and follow me and be a disciple of mine. Now, during Jewish history, a young Jewish boy, um, they would go to school and the ones that did well in school would kind of uh, apply for a discipleship type um, program in a sense, and it would be to be a disciple with a rabbi. And the rabbi would take, they would look at these students, and they obviously knew the best students, and they would pick from the best students to follow them, and they would teach them about scripture and what to do and how to pray and all these things, and take it in a, in a great distance of learning about his word. But when a rabbi specifically called out and selected a young boy, that was an honor to be selected by a rabbi to follow Jesus chose us he chose you he chose me he chose us to be a disciple of his he called us to be a student a pupil one who learns from him and what he does so that we could reproduce so that we could learn what he does and do what he does in this world we are called by him to be a disciple to follow him wherever he goes and do whatever he does to love how he loves to care how he cares that's what he calls us to do he calls us to leave where we're at and to follow him he doesn't call us out and say you know what i'm inviting you into a system of do's and don'ts no it's i'm calling you into a relationship he doesn't call us into um, an organization such as a local, local church. This isn't a club. He calls us into his church where he leads, the body of believers. That's what he calls us into. And we get to be that body of believers who represent him and his kingdom. In fact, that kingdom that is his, we inherit too, even as disciples of Jesus. So the question for you is, who are you? That's what we've been going through, right? Who are you? If you believe in Jesus, that he's the son of God, that, that your faith through him and him, you are forgiven, you receive that grace, you receive his righteousness, you are made new, the old life is gone, right? If you believe that, you are filled with his spirit, you have him in your life, and you are an ambassador, we talked about, right? You're an ambassador for him to represent him in his kingdom, 
You are a masterpiece because you were made and created by Him for a purpose in this world and in this life. And your identity also is that you're an overcomer. That through the testimony of your faith in Him, when you confront the things of this world that you face, that you have Him with you. That your faith will overcome those things. And next, yes, as an identity, you are a disciple. A disciple of Jesus. That is your identity. And it's important to know this. One, yes, we're going to look at why it's important that the world, our community, your neighbors, everyone knows that you're a disciple, but it's important that you wake up every day and you know your identity and realize I'm a disciple of Jesus. Why? Because he bought me. I belong to him. He paid the price. I am his. He is mine. He is my Lord, and I want to live as he lives. If I'm going to be that disciple, I'm going to live as he lives. I'm going to do what he does. I'm going to love how he loves, because that is what he calls us to do. So if we're going to be a disciple, a student of Jesus and who he is, we have to look at who he is to follow him, right? If we're going to go into this world and be disciples of Jesus to be like him, we have to know what he's like. So we have to have that relationship with him and seek him each and every day, praying to him, reading his word, looking at him as the example. If we're going to do what he does, we have to see what he's going to do. So one thing that Jesus does, we see in scripture that we must do is you find a need and meet it. You find a need and meet it. Now, Jesus shares this wonderful story in Luke. A great story about a man who had been robbed, beaten, stripped down naked, and left half dead on the side of the road. And what happens is the priest comes along. The priest, most often, if they were a priest, rode in a carriage. So there's a good chance he was in a carriage riding along. And there's this half dead man up ahead. And he even tells most likely his driver, Scoot over a little bit. Let's get away from them. Get on the other side. Um, I don't want to go near them, that person. And, and the, the idea here is most likely because he's the priest, there's, there's fears. One maybe is, well, he probably just doesn't care, honestly. And that's the point. But there's probably a fear of the fact that there's blood on him, that he might be dead. And if the priest touched him, then he will be unclean. And then he'll have to go through the ritual of being clean cleansed and he doesn't want to have to do that so he just doesn't care and he passes on by and then a levite is the one who comes next now a levite was someone who was often an assistant to the to the priest so there's a good chance who knows but this levite may have been an assistant to that priest maybe he was traveling to the same place where the priest was going he was just a little behind maybe he slept in i don't know there's no theology there just hang with me the levite though as he sees he walks to the side of the the road too. Maybe he has the same fears as the priest about touching him or getting near him, but he does not care. He has no compassion, no empathy, no sympathy even, and does not care about this man that is dying on the side of the road. But then Jesus gets to this next part, and what's cool is Jesus is sharing this story, mostly with Jews that are probably listening, right? And he gets to the hero of the story in a sense, and here's what he says, Luke 10, 33 through 37. But a Samaritan, now Samaritans were hated by the Jews. They were considered half-breeds, enemies of the Jews. So that's the hero that he is sharing in this story. A Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. And then he put, out, put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And then the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I will reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proves to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told them, go and do the same. Go and do the same. 
this Samaritan man had compassion, sympathy, empathy, and he displayed comfort to this man in his time of need. He saw the need and he wanted to meet it to help him. Not only to help him, but he saved his life probably. And he bandaged his wounds. He cleansed it with, with, the, with the olive oil and the wine. And he, he, he put him up on his donkey or a mule or whatever. And he rode him to an inn. And then he stays the night with him. That's how much he wants to care and make sure he's okay. He stays the night. And the next day he gets up and he gives the innkeeper more money. All that he probably had. And he says, take this and take care of him. And in fact, if it goes over, I'll be back. And I'll even pay more the extra cost of this. All because he cared. Now, this Samaritan held nothing back. Nothing back to care for this man. Jesus held nothing back to care for me, to care for you, to bring us back to God. He held, us, he held nothing back. And he calls us to, when they find those needs, to see those needs, and we meet them, and we hold nothing back. And here's the deal. It's going to cost that's the cost of discipleship. It's going to cost something of you to stop, to take care of a person, to share love, to share mercy, to share grace. It may even cost you financially. I don't know, but they're his resources, not yours. But he calls us to do the same. Go and do the same. This is what it's like to be a disciple to find those needs, to see those needs, and to meet them. Now, here's the problem, and I know it's my problem. Maybe you'll identify with this too, but I know it's my problem is we get preoccupied with life and we miss out seeing what is in front of us, those who need help. Here's the deal. Sometimes I think, I don't know if it's worse or not, but sometimes I'm like, I'm not even sometimes like the priest or the Levite. Sometimes I'm walking along the road and I'm choosing, I'm like, if I don't look over there, then it's not there. Then I don't have to go help. And maybe that'll make me feel better if I don't want to recognize it or acknowledge it even. I hate that about myself. I hate that I have to admit that that's sometimes what I do is I'm like, I don't even want to look. I don't even want to go over there. Maybe if I pretend it's not there, then I don't have to help. But we are not called to pretend that something's not there. We are called to see those needs and meet those needs as disciples. And we do help, but we get preoccupied. Maybe we're in a hurry. Maybe we're too busy. Maybe we're too judgmental. Maybe we're too proud. Maybe we're afraid of something. So we just pass on by all the needs that are in front of us where we could be helpful, where we could meet those needs, where Christ could work through us as a disciple to show them who he is. So who in your life are you caring for, loving on? Are your eyes open as you're walking down the road each and every day of your life, walking to work, through the halls, at school, or wherever you are at, are your eyes open to the needs that are in front of you? Because we have to meet those needs. There's needs here in the body of believers even that we should meet as a, as, as a group of disciples of Jesus. As a body of believers, we should help meet the needs of one another by even loving and caring and helping one another. But that's how we disciple one another. When people are lonely, we talk to them. Raise your hand if you're a good listener. I'm going to actually take mine down if I'm honest. I'm not a great listener, but if you are, who's a good listener? Anybody want to raise your hand? That's so amazing. That's one of the biggest steps right there. If you're a good listener, go listen, because that's what a lot of people need. That's how you can meet that need. Be a good listener. We have kids, even in this church, students and kids that desire to be loved and played with, and how are you going to help take care of them. There's some needs that don't always even seem like a need, but people step in and do them because they love and care for one another. I'm going to call him out right now. His name's Samuel over here. Communion, he loves making communion bread. Most of us don't know where that comes from. It just appears on a, on a platter up here. But because he loves making it, he loves Jesus, and he loves you, he provides that. 
We have students on Wednesday nights who eat some Wednesday nights. Someone could help feed them. Someone could help spend time with them. Do you realize that you could come here and meet needs by simply doing this, playing ping pong? Because they love playing ping pong. And it could all start right there of meeting a kid's need by spending time with them by playing ping pong. Let's take it further because it should never stop here. There's a whole community out there that needs disciples of Jesus to share his love and his mercy and his grace in. And you can go into this community. And it's great. There's, there's groups like Feed the Need that are gospel-based where you can go and you can not only serve someone and love on them and care for them, but you can even speak the words of, this, of Scripture out on them and you can speak that gospel even. And that's a great opportunity to do that. Uh, the Pregnancy Resource Center is also faith-based. You can do that. But don't stop there because there's people in this world and in this community that don't go to those places and they need to hear about Jesus too. They need to know who Jesus is. So you go to those that are not that and you bring the discipleship of Christ of who you are, that love to that place. You could go to our school district, BISD, and you can sign up to be a mentor to a kid that needs somebody to talk to every so often and you can listen and you can talk to them and you can care for them and here's the deal you can speak the gospel into their lives without anybody knowing that you're speaking the gospel by displaying the fruit of the spirit in your actions with them you have that ability to bring that to those areas there's other organizations and ways to do that in this community there's the children's advocacy center there's CASA the advocacy for in court for children There's ways that you could be a disciple of Christ in this community, showing them who he is. And here's the deal. I know you're saying, man, there's a lot. You're saying a lot, Nick. You're saying a lot. How do you expect me to serve in so many areas and do so many things and meet that many kind of needs? And I'm not expecting you. I'm expecting we, the body of believers, to do this. We do this together. In fact, that's the question you should be asking in a sense. Well, first is don't do this alone. None of this. Discipleship is not meant to be alone. So the question you need to ask yourself is who is coming with you? Who's coming with you? Who is going to come with you on this journey of discipleship? Another thing we as disciples do is we find a hurt and we heal it. Matthew 9, 35 through 36. Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the, of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus did amazing healings of people who were sick, who had diseases. And we still see that today. He works that way. But here's the deal. The most beautiful thing that he did in healing us, because he is the great physician, is that he healed our whole bodies. He healed our soul, our spirit. That if we put our faith in him, we are forgiven. And we get eternal healing in him. And our relationship with him, he heals everything about us. And we get to project some of that healing by walking in the testimony of our lives, of the gospel. But we see this in scripture too, of even uh, the woman caught in adultery, cast in front of him. Let's, Let's throw stones at her. He said, well, let the one without sin throw the first stone and all of them drop them. And then he says, who condemns you? And she says, no one. He says, neither do I. She was healed. Peter. Peter, before Christ was crucified, what does he do? He denies Christ three times and abandons him at the cross. Christ is resurrected. He's eating dinner uh, later with the disciples, and he's talking to, to Peter. And what does he ask Peter? Three times, do you love me? And all three, yes, Lord, I love you. And then he says, okay, feed my sheep. Peter's disappointment and shame and, and, and his rejection of Jesus and, and not being there in his time of need. And that disappointment is now turned into a reappointment of who he is in Christ, reminding him of his identity, that he is Christ, that he belongs to him, that he loves him. And he says, go and do what I taught you to do now. Go be a disciple of Jesus. Go start the church. That's what you're going to do. 
He was reappointed. And so it's important for us as disciples of Jesus, when we walk in this world, we're going to run into people that are hurt. And it may not be always something that we can help in the sense of the physical or modern medicine way, but we speak the gospel into their lives and they can be healed. That's how we can meet those hurting people in this world. And as followers, as disciples of Jesus, we run into those hurting people and we bring healing. We care. We love we listen, we pray, we cry, we forgive, we help. Now, one of the best ways we learn to do this first, as I said, is among ourselves. And one of the best ways that we can learn to do this is take this smaller, and if you are in a home group, if you have that kind of home group, man, you can really learn quickly how to love one another, care for one another, speak the gospel to one another, serve one another, pray for one another. But it can't stop there. It has to go out. It has to move into this body of believers, and then it has to move out into that community so that we can be disciples of Christ. So don't forget to ask the question even, who's coming with you? Who's going to come with you on this journey to walk alongside you? Because discipleship is not meant to be alone. Jesus clearly speaks how we are to live our lives as disciples. In John 13, 34 through 35, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. He doesn't say, they will know that you're my disciple if you keep going to church every Sunday. It's a good thing, but no, that's not. They will know that you're my disciple because of how often you pray. It's a good thing, but no. They will know that you're a disciple because you can quote more scripture than anybody. No. They're going to know that you're his disciple by the way you love. It's pretty simple. It's clear. Now, here's the deal. If you're like me, you're like, sometimes this is really hard on many days, though. And I just don't do something so simple. I can say it's simple. Yes, that sounds simple. Love as he has loved us but I don't do it some days. And the reason why I don't do it some days is as I wake up or I get up and I don't die to myself. I don't kill off the pride in my life or the fears or the selfishness. Instead, I give in to that selfishness. And when I give in to that selfishness and live that way, I live for myself, obviously. And then it's way easier to live for myself than selfless, right? It is for me. It's way easier to ignore the world, the hurt, and the pains, and all those needs out there, and just focus on myself. It's way easier to ignore that instead of helping and caring and loving. But that's not what he calls us to do. He says, I want you to die to yourself. Casting all of those sins to the side because he has already taken care of those of your pride and your selfishness and your fears. Stop holding on to them. Instead, walk with him. Follow him him and worship him as you do that be his disciple now as a disciple in christ we talk about how we uh, meet those needs and how we heal those who are hurting and we walk in this life and they're all before us but yes we do live busy lives we have jobs we got families we got um you got kids activities you got all these things and you can get distracted and i think it's important to know that because we are christians that you do a whole bunch of other things that we must remember to listen to his voice. We have to be in tune with the spirit that lives in us, with Jesus who we seek each and every day. For John 10 even tells us, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. We must follow him each and every day. Knowing his voice even in a fast-paced world, so that when we hear his voice, we slow down so that we can see what he's telling us, so that we can be led, direct, guided to what he wants us to do in those moments of how we could be a better disciple of his, how we could be an ambassador for him, how we can live out our purpose as his masterpiece, how we can overcome the thing before us. We listen to that voice to follow him in those times. Jesus called Peter and Andrew, right? 
to follow him. He said, throw down your nets, follow me, and we'll be fisher of men. Now, they didn't say, you know what? Okay, um, but there's things we need to take care of. Can you give me an itinerary of where, where we're going, Jesus? Um, Simon and Andrew, or Peter and Andrew didn't say, you know what? Let us list the, our boat for sale and we can have some money on this journey. Um, it doesn't sound like we're going to need it because we're fishing for men now. Um, or they didn't say, you know, let me check my retirement plan my 401k and maybe pull out some money. You know, Peter was married, the only disciple married, and so that I can give her some money if I'm going to be gone following you in a while. No, they didn't try to prepare for something that really wasn't there. And what I mean by that is they just simply were courageous and they stood up and said, yes, I will follow you. But if you're like me sometimes, I have fears and then I start preparing for something that's not really there. And when he calls me to do something, I'm like, I've got to prepare for this. Maybe he's even calling you right now or he's been speaking to you about following him, about putting your faith in him. And sometimes you're like, you know what? I, I like you, Jesus. I think that's true. I, I want you to be my Lord, but I got to clean, clean myself up. And that's not how it works. No, he says, I'm going to be the one who cleanses you. I already have. Just come to me. But sometimes he calls us to do something, and we're like, well, you know, that's great, Lord. I'm gonna, I, I think I could do that, but um, first I need to learn more. I need to read more. I need to pray more about this. i got to do these things. And you want to hold back, actually, and you're holding on to something, thinking you're preparing for something that's not really there to prepare for, because what he's called you to do, for, do in life is what you can do. He's not going to call you to something that you cannot do. And with him, you can do all things if we will just simply stand up courageously and say, yes, I will follow you. The spirit lives in you. The spirit empowers you. It gives you the words to say. It gives you his compassion even. It gives you his love because ours isn't good enough. It gives you the ability to speak into someone's life and make a difference. And here's what's beautiful about that. It doesn't only just make a difference in that moment. It's an eternal difference. And if we're willing to follow Jesus and do what he wants us to do as his disciples, it's eternal work always. It's not just for the moment, it's eternity. And don't do it alone. Who's coming with you? Is it someone next to you? Look around, maybe someone in this room. Maybe they're not in this room and that's okay, but don't do it alone. We walk in this world with Christ and with others, holding nothing back holding nothing back as disciples of Jesus, just as he held nothing back for us to be with him. Hold nothing back to care and to love and to follow him.